Welcome to episode 42 of Ping, a Firewalls.com podcast, a bi-weekly look at cybersecurity, including interviews, news, expert tips, and the latest trends. I'm Kevin Baxter, and I'm joined by my Firewalls.com colleague, Andrew Harmon. Hello there. Hey, Andrew. As we tackle a different featured topic each episode, new ones are normally out every other Wednesday, so subscribe or follow on your favorite podcasting platform to get the latest first. Please do rate and review us and drop us a line anytime at podcast at firewalls.com. As always, thanks for listening. And now it's time to introduce our featured topic and guest for this episode. With major cyber attacks becoming a somewhat regular occurrence these days, cybersecurity is becoming top of mind for many government officials, both federal and state. One initiative gaining momentum is the idea of liability protection for companies targeted by ransomware and similar attacks. Our guest on this episode will discuss why and where these safe harbor laws exist or are coming, and what companies would need to do to be eligible for this protection. Hint. It has to do with security, too. Joining us is Cynthia Brumfield, cybersecurity analyst, writer, and creator of the Metacurity newsletter. Cynthia, thanks very much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. We are glad to have you. And so to start this whole discussion off, can you give us a little bit of background on on what safe harbor laws are in the uh, cybersecurity context? Well, in the context of litigation, which is what we're talking about, now it following data breaches and very specifically there are a number of states that are beginning to adopt and have adopted laws safe harbor laws that give uh, companies some liability protection when the inevitable data breach lawsuits follow if the organizations have implemented strong security measures, in other words, if they have attempted to adopt, and I think the way the language is shaping up, reasonable security measures, then they're going to be given a break when it comes to what kind of damages that are levied against them in lawsuits or what kind of reach uh, litigants might have because the theory is that they've done a lot to try and protect themselves. And in that context or in those situations, they should be given some uh, something of a break because after all, data breaches are going to occur no matter what. Even the federal government, even as we have seen this week, the Department of Homeland Security <laughs> is subject to uh, it, you know, breaches and, and uh, intrusions, you know, noxious or, or uh, uh, negative cyber intrusions. So, you know, they're going to happen. The question becomes, do organizations do what they can reasonably to protect themselves and to protect their security? And that's what these data breach laws at the state level are attempting to sort of foster or to encourage companies to kind of really take seriously the kind of security programs they have in place. What's interesting about these particular state laws is that they are pointing to some sort of recommended frameworks, industry-leading cybersecurity frameworks, such as one that was adopted by the National Institutes of Standard and Technology in 2014 and then subsequently revised. It is the NIST Cybersecurity Framework for Critical Infrastructure. There's another sort of predominant cybersecurity framework that has, it's not a framework technically, but it is a series of critical security controls that have been put forth by a nonprofit organization called the Center for Internet Security, CIS. And what these state laws have done is reference these quite rigorous frameworks. And they say, if you've adopted them, if you follow them, if you can prove that you have tried to boost your best cybersecurity practices by implementing what these kind of well-regarded, nationally recognized cybersecurity frameworks and controls recommend, then we're going to give you a little bit of liability protection. Some liability protection, it remains to be seen because nothing has been litigated yet under these particular state laws, but we're going to give you some protection because you really have done a lot to try and ward off, you know, the negative fallout from a cyber attack. And that's basically, in a nutshell, what we're talking about. The concept of having liability protection or safe harbor 
has been raised many times at the national level, most recently in the context of hearings that had to do with some two major cyber attacks or cyber intrusions or cyber hacks that have occurred. The first, of course, is the solar winds mm -hmm. hack by the presumably in by all accounts, Russian state actors. And the second is the kind of infection of Microsoft Exchange server software, definitely implemented by Chinese state actors. So in the context of discussions surrounding these major significant hacks, the notion has been raised at the federal level yet again about having some sort of safe harbor some sort of liability protection when it comes to the inevitable lawsuits that follow these kinds of cybersecurity incidents. Right. And so far, it's definitely seemed like a, a state-led charge. I know in your article, you kind of outline the history of these starting in California with Kamala Harris when she was AG. Yes. There. Do you know about how many states have adopted these uh, safe harbor laws since that time over the years? Well, so that wasn't really that long ago. It was in February 2016 when Kamala Harris was the California Attorney General that the notion of pegging reasonable cybersecurity to these frameworks, to these robust cybersecurity guidance mechanisms, was 2016. So it really wasn't that long ago. It just feels like a long time ago. <laughs> it well, really does feel like a long I mean, I had to check the date, by the way, when I was sort of doing the research. And I had to check again. And I'm like, was she, was Kamala Harris <laughs> attorney general in 2016? That's yeah, it was hundreds of years ago. <laughs> yeah, it feels like a lifetime ago. But um, in any event, following California's sort of landmark decision to had reasonable security to recognize and, and highly respected and robust and, and vigorous standards, either the NIST framework or the, or the CIS critical controls. Following that, the state of Nevada issued a statute that basically did something of the same thing that California did. They then took it further and said that um, they would definitely define uh, reasonable cybersecurity and they would require their own state data collectors to comply with or follow the CIS controls or the NIST cybersecurity framework. And now they're in the process of actually implementing the safe harbor portion of that. But it was actually Ohio that became the first state in the country to enact a safe harbor for organizations. And that was followed by Utah, and now the state of Connecticut is beginning to tee up its own safe harbor law. And I think what's happening here, and this has happened in the context of other related issues, for example, almost every state in the country now and jurisdictions, including the District of Columbia or non-state you know, jurisdictions, have uh, data breach notification laws. Well, what happened was that, you know, one state adopted a data breach notification law and the next state adopted it and the next state adopted it. And suddenly it became a trend nationwide so that now every state has one. I don't know if we're going to see this kind of sweeping of the nation with the safe harbor laws that are pegging, you know, protection to the implementation or the adoption of these frameworks or not. Um, but it, it feels like it to me. It feels like this could be a trend. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing is happening in, in the data protection statutes. California adopted one that was really quite rigorous and then augmented that. And now Virginia has done something very similar. We have yet at the federal level to enact a federal data breach notification law but all the states have them. We have really not at the federal level uh, enacted the kind of very robust data protection law that California and now Virginia have implemented. So, you know, the states seem to be far ahead of the curve in some of these more progressive policies and laws that surround cybersecurity, at least in my view. And it's interesting too. Theoretically, there could even be incentives for companies to say, oh, Ohio has a safe harbor law. I'm considering expanding to uh, another location. Uh, maybe we should go here because we already take our cybersecurity measures 
quite seriously, whereas maybe they're currently looking at other states that uh, that don't have those laws in effect. It, it's quite possible. It certainly will alter incentives. I think that's the intent, at least, behind some of the laws, is to you know get organizations to behave in in different ways. Mm-hmm. I notice as uh, as we talk about this, you uh, sort of emphasize that these are very strenuous frameworks. Yes. So for I guess our most cynical listeners out there, how do we convince them that this won't just be a, a check mark on the list and a get out of jail free card? <laughs> well, the, by their very nature, the NIST cybersecurity framework and the CIS critical security controls took the opposite of a you know checklist approach to security. And so the one I am the most familiar with, and in fact, am, am writing a book on it that should be published at some point in December, is the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. And it really basically was the uh, culmination of a year's worth of intensive meetings among thousands of cybersecurity professionals, many of them from outside the United States who met at various locations and workshops to hammer out kind of a a framework that gives a philosophical guide, not a how-to guide on the things you have to do to manage your cybersecurity risks as effectively as you can. And it's a very, I don't want to say difficult, but it definitely requires commitment by the organizations. If they're going to prove in court, if they're going to say to any kind of, you know, litigant body that they've got, you know, that they have adopted the NIST cybersecurity framework, that means they've gone through some fairly, I keep using the same word over and over again, but rigorous steps to take care of, their internal security matters. Same thing with the CIS critical security controls, which are kind of like a a parallel to the NIST cybersecurity framework. They map to the NIST cybersecurity framework. The two sort of are very um, compatible with each other. You can't say that we have adopted the CIS critical security controls and then really have done nothing. I mean, that wouldn't hold water. You know, you really have to go through and do an asset inventory, for example. You have to show the court, well, look, we knew where all of our you know, internet connected devices were because we did an asset inventory as the critical security controls suggest or as the NIST cybersecurity framework suggests. So by their very nature, these standards, and there are others too that are involved in some of these statutes, such as something called the ISO 27,000 series or the FedRAMP security assessment framework. All of these kind of pieces of guidance are just by their very nature, you know, comprehensive and have teeth and have meaning. It's not a checklist. Yeah, it's, it's not, not a checklist. We have firewall, you know, that's the best we can do. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I mean, you can't say we implemented, you know, we installed antivirus and we have a firewall, therefore give us liability protection. It just won't work that way, the way these statutes are written. Yeah, it's not, it's definitely not like the the baseline of low-hanging fruit of cybersecurity. It's uh, it's really basically yeah. a, a philosophy that uh, that has to be backed up by resources and, and investment as well. Yes. And I think one of the things that's sort of come out of this recent series of discussions and hearings and webinars and talks given by industry leaders following the Solar Winds and the Microsoft Exchange Act is that the best way to ward off these kinds of assaults or these kinds of intrusions is to do exactly what these frameworks say you should do, which is really good cybersecurity. And you mentioned that we haven't actually seen a breach-related lawsuit from uh, a consumer affected by something so far. So we don't know exactly how this would play out, but... uh, Yeah. Theoretically, a consumer would would bring a lawsuit because a data breach occurred, and then the affected company would then have to sort of prove that they enacted these reasonable measures to at least somewhat mitigate their liability in this case? Yes. Okay. And how that plays out has yet to be determined. Mm-hmm. Because the interesting thing, because they're not checklists, there isn't, there isn't a, you know, for example, if you go to the NIST framework, and this is getting very 
complex and I, I don't want it to sound that way because it, I think it's a very good thing if people adopt these frameworks and security controls and I don't want to scare anyone away, but <laughs> there's no hard and fast, for example, compliance with the NIST framework. It's, it's not a concept. That's something that comes along with a checklist model of, of cybersecurity. So the NIST framework is kind of a very high level conceptual menu of things you can do as an organization to improve your risk management. And for some organizations, some parts of the framework might not apply. And for other organizations, other parts of the framework might apply. And so how you prove that you're following the NIST framework is going to be something of an interesting uh, <laughs> development. You know, yeah. because, and, and, and it actually, I think, would be very, you know, kind of educational and useful to advance the knowledge and the science. Yeah, that'd be an interesting first court case to see how you prove your philosophy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you prove it? So as far as the companies in states where the safe harbor laws have already been passed, are we seeing companies sort of embrace this? I haven't spoken to any organizations that have embraced it. It's all still relatively new. So for example, the Nevada statute that defines reasonable cybersecurity as compliance with these frameworks and controls only went into effect on January 1st, 2021. And Ohio Safe Harbor, I don't believe, has been not 100% sure when that went into effect, but it hasn't been tested. Utah just passed in March its state law that implements the Safe Harbor for when these statutes or when these frameworks or, or controls are adopted. So I don't know. I mean, it's always a challenge when it comes to cybersecurity because some of the things that these frameworks suggest, you know, cost money. Right. You have to hire people. You have to implement systems. And I think a lot of organizations are probably, as they have from, you know, the outset of the digital communications era, weighed the cost of implementing good cybersecurity or good security measures against whatever liability may come down the road. Right. So you mentioned that states have kind of been ahead of uh, the federal government on this. We know that it has been discussed a little bit federally, but right. do you think there could be a time where it does become sort of a, a national law that passes at some point? Well, I think when you get to the national level, you have some very powerful players. And this happened with the development of the NIST framework. You have some very powerful players who don't want anything that even remotely approaches a mandatory requirement. Now, none of the requirements that we've talked about at the state level are mandatory. Mm -hmm. They're optional. You can choose not to do what these safe harbor laws incentivize the organization to do. When it comes to- the, Choose not to get the liability protection, basically. Right. You can yeah. choose not to do that. You, Like I said, you can do the calculation. You can weigh- what the cost of implementing good cybersecurity is against whatever losses you may face in the future mm -hmm. from a breach lawsuit. But when you get to the national level, I mean, we don't have a national data breach notification law because there are fairly powerful interests who feel that is just imposing too much government involvement in business activities. So it, it, it almost almost automatically, you know, gets quashed. Same thing with, I mentioned earlier, the data protection laws, the California law and the Virginia law. One of the reasons we don't have one at the federal level is because you do have major players in this, in this context, different set of major players mm -hmm. that really don't ever can't come to grips on how such a thing would be structured at the federal level. So it's, it's much it seems to me it's much easier to get a lot of this stuff done at the state level. Well, the data protection laws uh, in particular, you're talking about not so much the voluntary adoption either, because if you have a data protection law in place and you're not complying and then right. something happens, then uh, then you're paying for it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, the upshot, though, is is really interesting. You know, so in the, if we're talking about data protection, some of the biggest 
opponents of a federal law have been the online service providers such as Facebook and, and other major internet companies. And mm. what they've ended up with are much tougher laws <laughs> at the <laughs> state level that they nonetheless are going to have to abide by because you can't ignore a state like California or Virginia or some of the other states who have implemented data protection measures. Mm. So it's 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 quite interesting what's going on here. Right, and uh, at this point, kind of straying off the the main subject a little yes, bit. Yes, we are. <laughs> how this would interact with even cybersecurity insurance companies out there. I mean, if you have this kind of legal liability, do you get cheaper rates to ensure your network security? It's uh, a lot of questions out there. You know, that it, that is really interesting. And, you know, I did a column a couple of months ago, maybe. I can't even remember. As we talked about earlier, time is... Time is <laughs> it's all relative. <laughs> it's a construct at this point. It always has been, but now it's more so. <laughs> but I did a column on how cybersecurity, how insurance companies themselves are starting to become concerned about the massive breaches that are have, you know, kind of hit over the last four or five months or the hacks or the attacks. Phraseology here is really important, but mm -hmm. because the liabilities that they are on the hook for are escalating and ransomware. Ransomware is something that is, you know, just it's a scourge that doesn't seem to have an end to it. So, you know, insurance companies themselves are having to figure out how to manage their own risks in this environment. And I'm not, I haven't spoken to them about these laws, but I'm sure it would help a quite a bit if you could say uh, we, we comply with Ohio's safe harbor, you know, requirements and therefore, you know, give us some you know, beneficial considerations. I, I could see that happening. Right. And by the same token, it could help maybe consumer confidence if other companies were going to consider a couple of options for a provider of some kind that would be holding their data if they knew that company X was embracing these standards and company Y doesn't have any information about that, sort of the same thing could occur. That That's quite likely. So we touched on the, the data protection laws. We were touching on this safe harbor side of things. Are we just now really in the last five to 10 years moving into the phase where cybersecurity laws are getting on the books, whereas before it was just sort of an issue that was out there that wasn't being codified so much? Well, yes, I think that's true. But I also think it's just the nature of the evolution of the digital economy we live in. I mean, mm -hmm. cybersecurity was not a notion in the year 2000, yes, it was out there, was that 21 years ago? It was out there, but it wasn't, you know, even then I think everyone felt comfortable that I, I think they were just not, you know, security was an add-on. It wasn't the fundamental concept underlying the internet. It, it, the internet evolved without any kind of driving force that would incentivize security. So it, the whole nature of the field itself is brand new. It, yeah. it's, it's, you know, taking some time for the law to catch up with it. And, you know, it's quite possible that this is such a complex measure, you're never going to see any real, and I don't think you want to see real laws that mandate lots of things in terms of cybersecurity. It's just too difficult. It's too fragile on the one hand and too vast on the other. And you need to give organizations the opportunity to step up and do the right thing voluntarily. But it's all still really, really new back into the law side of things there's there's another piece that you wrote recently that uh, we've touched on solar winds a little bit and you wrote about the cyber diplomacy act at the federal <laughs> level was considered in the past and sort of coming back up again here in 2021 how does that come into play in terms of a more national cybersecurity posture with those solar winds and other attacks that we've just talked about well it's very it's critical and it's critical because the two threats that I, I have cited a couple of times during this conversation come from foreign actors. And you know, in one case, it's Russia. In the other case, it's China. And under the Trump administration, the diplomatic skill set in the federal government was, was eradicated, literally you know, kind of removed and downplayed and unfunded. And so we were kind of left sitting for four years without any forward momentum in terms of establishing international norms, although we have norms, you know, in terms of 
sort of like quote unquote a Geneva Convention when it comes to cybersecurity. There are many international measures that, let's say, we wanted to litigate something like the, you know, in, in an international court of justice, something like the Microsoft Exchange intrusion, which most professionals consider far more egregious, even if far less reaching, perhaps, than the Solar Winds hack. Um, the solar winds hack is, is considered just basic espionage. We do that too. Every nation does it. Russia did it. Okay, you're never going to deal with that on a diplomatic level. You might deal with something like the Microsoft Exchange hack in international fora through diplomatic measures. And if diplomatic measures don't apply through strategic sound kind of, I don't want to use, you know, kind of sanctions of some kind that has the backing of the international community and that could get the, the country to move forward. But, you know, right now, you know, we're, we're coming from a hole that was created by four years of just complete undermining of any diplomatic status of the United States when it comes to cybersecurity. Yeah. So this was a law that had been out there for a while, but hadn't pushed through in any way. Do you feel like there is momentum towards it happening now with the, yes. the current administration? Yes. And I, I think the current administration has, you know, President Biden has said very specifically, and I think, you know, out loud and in various forums, you know, and including through his press secretary, Jen Psaki, has said cybersecurity is a top priority. We're waiting this week for news of some executive orders on cybersecurity that could have some major impact on all everything we've talked about. And I think that something called the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, which was an organization that is public-private comprehensive commission established to brainstorm new ways to solve these very complex cybersecurity matters has over the course of the last six months been extremely effective in implementing laws at the federal level that come out of their considered deliberation on on cybersecurity. And so the combination of the fruition of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission's efforts and the Biden administration's commitment to being serious about cybersecurity bodes well, both for the Cyber Diplomacy Act, as well as other measures that may move through Congress. Great, Cynthia. Thanks uh, very much for joining us. Where can people find more from you? Well, you can find my work in a variety of places. I, I recommend you check out metacurity.com. It's a daily newsletter that pulls together what folks need to know about the news of the day. It's metacurity, M-E-T-A. C-U-R-I-T-Y dot com. I also am a regular columnist for CSO Online. Just Google CS. I think it's just CSO Online dot com. And then my uh, corporate website is DCT hyphen associates dot com. And there's some other information there on other efforts we're working on, including the book I mentioned. And I encourage folks to feel free to email me or DM me if they have any questions. Nice. You said that book's coming in December? December, yes. Uh, John Wiley and Sons. It's yes. on cybersecurity risk management, and it focuses on the NIST framework. Very good. Thank you very much. As uh, Andrew said, we'll keep an eye out for that. And again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Now it's time for headlines. In this regular segment, we take a closer look at a few top stories in the cybersecurity world and discuss what they may mean to you. Now headline number one. Policyholders may be the primary target in hack of cyber insurance provider CNA. Insurance firm CNA Financial, a prominent provider of cyber insurance, confirmed a cyber attack against its systems in March and in what may be a bit of a long game, which we've seen in other breaches recently. Instead of directly targeting CNA's money, there's uh, some thought that the attackers may have targeted their customers. So why would they do that? Right. Well, as you said, this is an insurance agency, and this particular one is in the business of cybersecurity insurance, ironically enough. And mm. uh, so as these hackers get in the system and 
are able to pull the database of who their customers are and what kind of coverage they have, that gives them a slew of new targets that they know is more likely to pay because they know that their butts are covered by this insurance company. Yeah, we've we've heard in the past how uh, if hackers know that a company is insured, they may be a, a bit more likely to go after them. And as we'll see in our next story, I guess we'll hear it more than anything. They do tend to pick those victims who are most likely to pay. And also the information that they could potentially get out of this uh, insurance agency would also tell them exactly how much they're likely to pay. Right. It's also a little funny that our guest just earlier in this episode brought up the uh, the possibility of this kind of thing happening. And here we are immediately talking about it afterwards. I didn't want to interrupt her conversation earlier to <laughs> pre-plug ourselves, but yeah, uh, built in foreshadowing. <laughs> Yes, we've uh, we've had a lot of that, in, and we will continue to have that during this headline segment. So according to Bleeping Computer, CNA suffered a ransomware attack using a new variant called Phoenix Crypto Locker that is possibly linked to our friends at the Evil Corp hacking group, which we've talked about before. CNA confirmed an attack occurred, saying it was a sophisticated cybersecurity attack, which caused a network disruption and impacted certain CNA systems, including a corporate email. But they didn't say exactly which uh, version of uh, ransomware that they dealt with or that they definitely dealt with ransomware. Right. And we've seen a lot of Evil Core over the years. They are actually sanctioned at this point. And so insurance companies like CNA themselves would not be able to make payouts to a federally sanctioned group like this. However, because this was not in that wasted locker ransomware family, they can't exactly attribute it to the same people. And uh, I, I suppose that means sanctions are lifted. Yeah, that seems like another one that's somewhat hard to enforce, even if it's just like a splinter group of people who used to be involved in Evil Corp. Maybe they're rebranded. Yeah, or they've got another a band on the side from their uh, their main band that they play with most of the time. Over 15,000 devices on the CNA network were reportedly encrypted with remote workers who were connected via VPN at the time also affected. And, you know, it's currently unclear what uh, client information may have been compromised, but, you know, there are going to be quite a bit of insights that the hackers could get if they have a list of those customers and maybe some policy information too. Yeah, right. They'd even be able to tailor the exact uh, ransom amount that they ask for based on what kind of policy coverage they see for each customer. Yeah, and uh, this is a $10 billion a year company based out of Chicago. So that tells you they probably have a few high profile clients in the uh, cyber insurance game. Looking at the ransomware itself, uh, this Phoenix locker, I don't notice too much special or new that stands out about it other than the .phoenix file type extension that it encrypts files to and the phoenix-help text uh, where you know you get your friendly instructions on how to open your network again. Yeah, it is kind of funny that uh, a lot of times with these crypto locker or ransomware files that uh, one of the major differences just between them simply seems to be the file extension that's used, even if the rest of it is uh, fairly similar. Yeah, innovation in the ransomware industry. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so going back to the whole theft of information, uh, one, we don't know for sure that it's occurred because, um, you know, typically, at least in the old days, ransomware was just about locking up files and uh, demanding a ransom. But uh, more and more over the last, I'd say, what, year or so, uh, that the uh, threat actors who are uh, throwing out the ransomware are also uh, exfiltrating some of those files and using them for other reasons as well. So so that's why that is thought to be the case here. And if they did take those files, uh, one person quoted in uh, in the story that we're using, Aaron Portnoy with Rand Dory says, the theft of customer policies is the sword of Damocles that has been hanging over the cyber insurance industry since its inception. So uh, anytime you can drop sword of Damocles in a, a quote, you gotta, gotta use Very that. <laughs> so, um, 
Yes, this is something to uh, definitely watch, and uh, we'll see if we get a little more information in terms of uh, what data was stolen, if any. And, um, you know, even the data beyond knowing what the ransom is uh, or what the uh, top ransom amount could be, uh, there's even thoughts that uh, they could target exactly what cybersecurity measures a company has in place, like which brand of, of firewall or endpoint or uh, any other things that they may have that are unique identifiers. I don't know if that would just scare people more or in the uh, ransom demand or, or what, but uh, I guess any extra information in the hands of the bad actors is uh, probably not ideal. Yeah, never a good thing. So that's a pretty good segue into our next story, which we'll get to right now. And headline number two, Fat Face pays out $2 million to Conti ransomware gang. UK fashion retailer Fat Face has reportedly paid that $2 million ransom to those responsible for a ransomware attack it suffered earlier this year. Little side note in this story that we don't really pursue for the rest of it, but uh, it's, uh, it's a funny side note. The company made headlines by appearing to ask its customers to keep its cyber attack on the down low, basically. <laughs> yeah, we can just keep that between us and... <laughs> Which, uh, it's interesting that they would actually go out of their way to, you know, notify customers of that because that's, that could get them into more trouble with regulators down the road. Right, yeah, this is just between the company, the hackers, and the several hundred thousand of you, so <laughs> keep it on the down low. <laughs> What's interesting about this story is uh, that you actually get to see some chat logs between the people named Support, Support being the party negotiating on the, the side of the ransomware group, and a, uh, a blacked out name of some sort, which is an entity at Fat Face, uh, presumably, or maybe an insurance company or re recovery team, whoever's on point for, for them in this communication stream, where they negotiate in real time, uh, going back and forth with different offers. It's like a little business meeting. Yeah, yeah. It is interesting because we know that this occurs, but don't really get to uh, take a look inside. So Fat Face reportedly entered negotiations uh, with the Conti ransomware gang soon after became aware its systems had been breached and customer information stolen in January. The first demand was approximately valued at about $8 million, which happened to coincide very closely with the thought of what Fat Face's ransomware insurance policy was at 7.5 million pounds. So do you want to go over a little bit of, uh, of the chat log example then to give our listeners a little bit extra insight? Sure, yeah. So starting off here between, as we said, support, which is Mr. Mr. Ransomware communication person, and the redacted name, they kind of talk about their revenue for the last year and how COVID has impacted that briefly. And then they bring up the cyber insurance policy, as you said, uh, quoting that $7.5 million insurance policy as the the reason they came up with that number and uh, they kind of go back and forth and there's an argument that uh, loss of revenue over the last year means that the ransomware should be lower it's it's an interesting dynamic <laughs> it's interesting that the negotiations then do you actually take them somewhere to off of that uh, that high amount that they initially ask for? So Fat Face was able to sort of talk it down after after you said they said you know our brick and mortar business is not not looking so good right now, and that's where we do a lot of our sales. So eventually they work their way all the way down to that uh, two million dollar amount rather than roughly 8 million that was initially asked for. <laughs> they even have a nice little uh, offer at the end, the uh, the hacker group. Yes, they actually uh, offered to teach Fatface how to better protect themselves <laughs> in the future. So, <laughs> you know, that's customer service with a little added benefit of uh, not having to reach out to that same representative twice. Yeah, and Conti also explained how they initially breached Fatface with a phishing attack back on January 10th. The attackers were then able to use the initial compromise as a base for gaining admin rights and then uh, spreading laterally through Fatface's network, which uh, 
in our previous episode where we were talking to Brooke Chelmo with SonicWall, he said basically that's that's one of the goals of almost any breach these days is to get in and then go sideways from there. Right. And uh, just as the last story, there was some data exfiltration involved. Uh, 200 gigs worth of data was taken off of the systems before the files were encrypted. And so in this case, we do have confirmation that data exfiltration was part of the deal. Yeah, and a timeline. So they got in on January 10th, and then the data was taken over the course of about a week, and then the systems were encrypted by the ransomware on January 17th. So very interesting look at uh, like a a deeper dive into a ransomware attack that, uh, you know, ended up working out pretty well for the attackers. And hopefully for that face that uh, is in their rearview mirror now too. Yeah, hopefully that's something they can recover from. Um, I guess good job to their negotiator for uh, (laughs) million dollars off the price. And uh, hopefully they will take that free IT vice to heart. I don't know if I'd call it free, but (laughs) I hope they they make use of that data. And so all of our stories kind of uh, tie into each other today. So let's jump into headline number three. Ransomware admin is refunding victims their ransom payments. So uh, again, three for three on the ransomware front today just uh, happens to be the case. And we've talked about the fact that ransomware is just about everywhere lately. So after recently announcing the end of its operation, the administrator of Ziggy Ransomware is now saying that uh, they will also give victims their money back, which is a kind of unprecedented step, I think. Yeah, and uh, perhaps even more unprecedented is the reasoning. He just decided he was sad about what he did and (laughs) was going to make good on it. Yeah, so the uh, administrator shared the, quote, good news at first and uh, a few days passed and then followed up with, uh, with more details, basically, about the fact that they were going to give back the money. So it started with shutting down the Ziggy ransomware in early February when the administrator said they were sad, as you said, about what they did, and they decided to publish all decryption keys. And did they follow through? They sure did. On February 7th, uh, they offered 922 decryption keys, as well as the source code for a decryptor that does not require an internet connection. So I'd say as thoroughly as possible, they make good on their word. Yeah. So uh, they even have an email address to contact the admin, Ziggy Ransomware at uh, ccmail.pro with the proof of their payment in Bitcoin and their computer ID. And the admin would then and return the money to the victim's Bitcoin wallet in about two weeks, according to the instructions. Yeah, and this is the part of the story that gets into some fun math work. <laughs> so, as most people know, ransomware ransoms are paid in Bitcoin in most cases, uh, mm-hmm. it's a secure for you know the the hacking party. Uh, yeah. So the uh, the returned money will be returned at the valuation in fiat currency at the time that they asked for the Bitcoin. And so at the time of most of these hackings, the Bitcoin price was down around 39,000. If you follow the stock market or currency trades, uh, you know that's about 61,000 now. So almost double the value since he has taken this money and he will be returning it at the original value. Yeah, so it's actually a a smart investment for him and uh, (laughs) he'll still be able to come out on top in theory and then also get the victims back to where they were. So yeah, it's it's kind of tricky with something that's volatile like Bitcoin. And if you just use dollars or euros or pounds or whatever, that's that's more fixed. I mean, that goes up and down a little bit from time to time, but not to the level yeah. of <laughs> Bitcoin. Oddly enough, the admin did say he had to sell his house in order to make these refunds happen, which uh, I don't, following the math that we just ran through there, I don't quite understand. But he claimed that he was from a third world country and that his motivation for this entire gamble was basically just financial. And I mean, there's possibilities there, too, just because Bitcoin has gone up since uh, initially collecting these ransoms. 
we don't know that the admin actually kept the Bitcoin as it rose, maybe translated that money, uh, the Bitcoin, into a different type of currency more immediately if uh, if they needed money right away. So uh, it's sort of speculative to say that the admin just uh, kept it and has uh, sort of invested in the growth of Bitcoin. So it's possible, I guess, that the money was already out of Bitcoin and, and more at a fixed price. And then maybe that uh, person already spent a lot of it. So I, I guess I could see how selling the house might be a need if uh, if all of that is true. Yeah, he had to sell the house that he bought with the stolen money. So <laughs> we'll all feel very badly for him. Uh, funny enough, I guess there's a silver lining to this story beyond just everybody getting their money back. And that is that part of his motive was fear of being caught by law enforcement. Uh, we've seen some pretty big names and operations getting stung lately. And so perhaps that, that fear is starting to spread and get real for people. Yeah, I mean, that is a side effect. It's not just stopping the particular... Uh, ransomware or uh, hacking group that's been targeted. It's also putting everyone else on notice. And if uh, if there's some sort of connection with maybe the countries that have been involved in investigations, or maybe the person knows people in the other group and is getting a little gun shy based on uh, maybe somebody potentially turning on them, any of that's possible. But I, I, I would be interested to see if this person were to get caught, then what would happen? Would would this all, would everyone go, okay, you did, you returned everything, so uh, we'll just uh, let you off with a stern warning now, or we'll... Learned your lesson on this one, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Or, yeah. I mean, you'd hope that the person trying to preempt the punishment would uh, would get off a little easier, but you don't know if that would be the case. Right. So I guess this is a, a good reason to cheer for law enforcement, at least in their efforts to track down network security threats like this, as it's starting to have some actual ramifications. Yeah, so we talked cyber insurance related to ransomware. We talked about an actual ransomware incident and uh, and how the payout happened. And now we're talking about how uh, a ransomware operator decided uh, to, to go straight, basically. So uh, sort of a play in three acts on ransomware. Full circle. Uh, it's interesting. A lot of these guys will tend to come back in a few years and will, in fact, join the, the white hat side. And I believe uh, this guy was actually quoted as saying that is part of his plans is to, as you said, go straight and maybe even lend his skills to uh, the good guys moving forward. Yeah, so we'll keep an eye on this and see if we get any more updates because you m you'd think that maybe if this person does go full on white hat that uh, they may want to tell their story non anonymously at some point. Right. Yeah. Uh, do we have the money for a Ziggy Stardust sample? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'll have to. I'll have to look into that one. But if not, just go with our normal music. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. And thanks again to Cynthia Brumfield for joining us. Find her at Metacurity and check out the links in the description for more information about everything we discussed. Subscribe or follow now however you listen to ensure you get our latest episodes as soon as they're available. And please do rate and review us. Visit firewalls.com for all your network security needs and give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. For Andrew Harmon, I'm Kevin Baxter. We'll be back soon with another episode. But in the meantime, we'll remind you to get secure, stay, stay secure. secure.